So this lecture is a continuation on the simplex algorithm. This is lecture four for IE3340, Operation Research. And the last thing that we discussed was in terms of finding the decision variables or the, non, the basic variables and non-basic variables for a linear program. And by identifying the non-basic variables and the basic variables, we were able to identify, or by solving for two of them in this case, making the non-basic variables equal to zero and solving for the other two, we were able to find the corresponding corner points in a graph for a two decision um, linear program. So moving forward, we are going to start solving problems, uh, linear program, uh, linear programs with more than two decision variables. And so far we learned the, the graphical method and the graphical method as, as we have explained, it, it is only useful for problems that have two decision variables or less. So now we, are, we want to find a, a, a way to solve problems that have more than two decision variables or linear programs that have more than two decision variables. And that's why we are going to introduce the, the simplex algorithm. The simplex algorithm, as, as we mentioned in previous lectures, it uses the, the gauss jordan method uh, to solve a, a set of linear equations. But in this case, the simplex algorithm is also taking into account the objective function for the problem while solving those, those equations. So in this lecture, we're gonna focus on the simplex algorithm. I'm gonna teach you how to apply the simplex algorithm to solve uh, linear programs. The general description of the simplex algorithm, solving an LP in a maximization problem is, is described here. So step one, we're gonna find a basic feasible solution to the linear program. And we will call this the basic feasible solution, the initial basic, basic feasible solution. In general, the most recent basic feasible solution will be called the current um, BFS. So at the beginning of the problem, the initial basic feasible solution is the current basic feasible solution. So after finding the, the initial uh, basic feasible solution, step number two determine if the current basic feasible solution is an optimal solution to the linear program. If it is not, we are gonna find an adjacent basic feasible solution that has a larger Z value. So at this point, what we're gonna do is, okay, we have a, we, we're gonna evaluate the current solution and, and the algorithm is gonna let us know if we can improve or not. If we can improve, what we're gonna do next in this step is to find an adjacent point, as we learned in the previous lecture, that will give us a better optimal solution, in this case, a larger Z value because we are maximizing. In step three, we're gonna to return to step two using the new basic feasible solution at the current basic solution. And we're gonna continue this loop until we have no, uh, we find no improvement in our solution. So let's look at the simplex algorithm. Uh, so again, the simplex algorithm for procedure for maximization linear programs. Step one is to convert the linear program to standard form. And you are, are familiar with that process already. So we're gonna make uh, inequalities equalities by adding slack variables or subtracting excess variables. And then after the problem is in standard form, we're gonna obtain a basic feasible solution, if possible, from the standard form. After finding that initial solution, we're gonna determine whether the current basic feasible solution is optimal. If it is not optimal, we're gonna determine which non-basic variable should become a basic variable, and which basic variable should become a non-basic variable to find a basic feasible solution with a better objective function value. So if you remember from our previous uh, video, 
we can find the points in the uh, feasible region, adjacent points in the feasible region by uh, looking at different combinations of basic and non-basic variables. So that's what the algorithm is doing. Step five, use the elementary row operations that we learned in linear algebra in the gauss jordan method to find a new basic feasible solution with a better objective function value. And we're gonna continue, we return to step three until we determine whether or not the solution is optimal. So when we find an optimal solution, then we stop. So in performing the simplex algorithm, we write the objective function in the form z minus zx1 minus cx2 minus dot 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 cnxn equals zero. So the idea, you know, and typically if you have a maximization problem, max z, um, and let's say that the objective function is x1, x2, what you're gonna do is you're gonna move those x1 and x2 to the left hand side and then you're gonna make this equal to zero. Okay, so that's the form. We call this format the row zero version or row zero for short of the objective function. And you will see what that means in a second. We call this row zero because it's gonna be a row in a table. And row zero is the, the first row or the row at the top. So let's consider this example. Consider the simplex algorithm applied to the following problem. We had a Dakota furniture company, manufactures desks, tables, and chairs. The manufacturer of each type of furniture requires lumber and two types of skill labor, finishing and carpentry. The amount of each resource needed to make each type of furniture is given in the table below. So we have three um, products the decks, the table, and a chair. And each one of them requires a certain amount of material, finishing hours, and carpentry hours. At present, we have 48 board feet of lumber, 20 finishing hours, eight carpentry hours. Um, and that's, that's, those are the resources that we have available. Also, we have information about uh, the, the price of each product. So a desk sells for $60, a table for 30, and a share for 20. The company believes that demand for desks and shares is unlimited, but at most five tables can be sold. Since the available resources have already been purchased, Dakota wants to maximize the total revenue. Formulate and solve an LP or linear program to maximize the total revenue. Okay, so we are gonna formulate this problem. So what are the decision variables? The decision variables are the number of, uh, that you're gonna produce for each one of the product types. So I'm calling X1 number of desk, X2 is the number of tables, and X3 is the number of shares. We are gonna maximize our, our revenue, and we know the, the price for each one of the products, so we are multiplying uh, $60 times X1 plus $30 times X2 plus $20 times X3, and this is our objective function. And then we have three constraints. Each uh, of the constraints is representing the capacity limitation for each one for, for a resource. So we have the materials for the lumber constraint, we have the finishing constraint, which is in terms of hours, and also carpentry constraint, which is also in terms of hours. And we also have a, a constraint for the demand of tables. So we know that we can produce at most five. And this is the, the, the formulation for this problem. So the first step in the simplex algorithm is to convert the LP to standard form. Okay, so, so this is the standard form. As we, as we discussed we in, in the previous slide, 
we are going to transform the objective function to this form, the row zero version. Okay, so we're going to move the um, the equation for the objective function to the left, and we're going to subtract that equation to uh, so z is going to be um, z minus the 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 equation for the objective function, and that's the row zero version of the Okay, so that's why we call it the row zero, is that it is at the top, and it represents the, the row zero version of the objective function. And then for each one of the constraints, we have a, um, we have a row, a separate row, and we're gonna put those constraints into standard form. So we have inequalities uh, that are less than or equal to, so in order to make them equalities, we are going to add a slack variable. So for the set, for the first constraint, we have plus S1 equals 48. Uh, for the second constraint, we have S2 equals 20. And for the third constraint, we have S3, and the constraint equals eight. And then we have also a slack variable for the, for the fourth constraint, X2 plus S4 equals five. Um, so, for us to find that initial solution, the basic feasible solution, we have to look at the format of, of this table. And if you see, um, the easiest way for us to, to set up this um, initial solution is by making x1, x2, and x2 equal to zero. Because in that way, we can solve for the values of s1, s2, s3, and s4. Thus, the basic uh, variables are going to be those uh, slack variables, and the known basic variables are x1, x2, and x3. So we're going to let x1, x2, and x3 equal to 0, and then we're going to solve for s1, s2, s3, and s4, and we're going to find that initial solution. That initial solution is, is very simple, because since this is becoming 0, then S1 is going to be equal to 48, S2 is going to be equal to 20, S3 is equal to 6, and X4, X4, S4 is equal to 5. So each constraint is in canonical form with a non-negative right-hand side. And the canonical form, basic variables have a coefficient of 1, or a coefficient equal to 1, in one row, and zeros in all the other rows. Therefore, a basic feasible solution can be obtained by inspection, which is what, what we did here. Step two, obtain a basic feasible solution. To perform the simplex algorithm, we need a basic, uh, although not necessarily non-negative, variable for row zero. Since z appears in row zero with a coefficient of one and z does not appear in any other row, we use, z, we use z as the basic variable. With this convention, the basic feasible solution for our initial canonical form has the basic variables, which were the slacks, and we are also adding the z from the objective function. For this initial basic feasible solution, z is gonna be equal to zero, s1, equals 48, S2 equals 20, S3 equals eight, S4 equals five, and X1, X2, and X3 equals zero. Note that a slack variable can be used as a basic variable if the right-hand side of the constraint is not negative. Once we have obtained a basic feasible solution, we need to determine whether it is optimal. To do this, determine if there's there is any way Z can be increased by increasing some non-basic variable from its current value of zero while holding all other non-basic variables at the current values of zero. Solving for Z in row zero yields Z equals 60 X1, 30 X2, and 20 X3. For each non-basic variable, we can use the equation above to determine 
if increasing a non-basic variable while holding all other non-basic variables to zero will increase Z. Increasing any of the non-basic variables will cause an increase in Z. So we know X1, X2, and X3 are non-basic variables, right? And right now, they're, all of them are equal to zero. So what this is saying is, if you increase any of these three non-basic variables, for sure you're gonna increase the objective function. For example, if you make X1 equals one, then you know the objective function is gonna be equal to 60. If you make X2 equals to one, and the other two zero, you know that the objective function is gonna be equal to 30, 30 times one. If you make X3 equal to one, and the X1 and X2 equal to zero, you know the objective function is gonna be equal to 20 times one, which is 20. So increasing any of the non-basic variables will increase and in, will, in, will cause an increase in Z or the objective function. However, if we look at those three options, increasing X1 causes the greatest increase in Z because X1 is multiplied by 60. So if X1 increases from its current value of zero, it will have to become a basic variable. For this reason, X1 is called the entry variable. And so we notice that we don't have enough optimal solution, right? We, we, we find that we don't have an optimal solution by looking at the objective function and finding out if we